want to thank the Center for Media and Social Impact and also the uh, people who supported this convening, who also supported the Return and Return Project, Ford and Fledgling Fund, both integral partners for us. Um, for decades, I have been an investigative reporter and filmmaker working on issues primarily around uh, criminal justice and mass incarceration. And as someone who also really deeply cares about social change on these issues, um, there's been one sort of set of um, pernicious stereotypes, one dominant narrative that has, I've wrestled with more than any other, and that's of the inmate or the prisoner. I probably don't have to show you this for you to conjure these images that we've been socialized into for decades. They're you know, drawn in mostly racialized binaries of us versus them, um, good versus evil. They're seen as having broken the social contract in a way that they just don't deserve our sympathies anymore, and that's that. Uh, for you know, Since the late 70s, early 80s, we've really drawn both literal and figurative walls around this population, and that's starting to change a little bit, arguably, recently, but still, this is you know a, a population that suffers, no doubt, from dominant narratives that work against them. The truth that I've found, and that many of you probably know as well, is much more nuanced and complicated. More than half the prison population, or roughly half, is serving time for nonviolent offenses. Uh, the ones who are considered violent or serious, the other half, that can be very sort of um, uh, misrepresented. It can be uh, something that just varies state by state. Just as one example, in our story that we told, a serious offense that could get you life in prison was stealing a bike from a garage. So um, clearly, there's huge sets of populations within prison that don't fit what the stereotype is. So what do we do in order, you know, people who really work in these areas and care about what we see as uh, narratives that misrepresent and are destructive, not just to those people, but to society, um, to sort of bring that, those narratives closer to the truth. Uh, what I've found, and I've sort of moved through a variety of storytelling methods during my career, is that close to the bone depth storytelling um, in the way that I do it with Kelly and others is with no narration, no outside experts, you know, sit down interviews, but just the experts we call them who are indigenous to the story. Um, as a way of just going so deep and developing such dimension that uh, it's a sort of powerful tool in this asymmetric battle of representation. Um, the Return, uh, which Katie mentioned, was our last feature doc. So it looked at the first time in history that citizens scaled back sentences of the currently incarcerated. And as a result, since 2012, thousands of lifers have gotten out in California. So lifers, right? That's a, a sort of a nomenclature, a status that evokes a lot of those scary images. Um, and so we wanted to use it as an opportunity both to think about what the public was starting to talk about, how to scale down mass incarceration writ large. Um, if we were gonna do that, how are we gonna do that? But also as an opportunity in a feature doc to really uh, poke holes in and sort of start to dismantle um, some of the really uh, reductionist and problematic stereotypes. So we followed, um, we followed the story as it unfolded uh, through the lives of just a small handful of people, and the central characters were people who had been incarcerated and were coming out. So we all know as storytellers that you know it's this me, this oversaturated environment where distractibility is at an all-time high. We have to be, we have to be sort of grabbed right from the beginning by our characters. Um, but I also have found that if a sort of a representation is too off kind of um, archetype or stereotype. I, I do national public television, so this is the audience I'm thinking about. It's a, it's a broad political and ideological continuum. How am I going to not lose people who have a certain idea and are going to shut down, right? So here we have the first scene with Bilal, one of our central characters. Connect before you correct. So we see him walk into this men's home. They're all, they're all people who are formerly incarcerated. They are... Um, talking about how much time they've done. 
we hear that, you know, he's a repeat offender, a lifer, that he was sentenced to 150 years to life, and this is Bilal. Um, I'll get back to, so that's sort of the onion, right? That's the onion that we're gonna then peel away, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but uh, another really important point is to broaden points of connection for a, you know, it depends on your audience again, but for a national audience, for we're all hoping for broad audiences in many cases, right? There are going to be people who are just not going to identify with those central characters who have been incarcerated. So what do you do? Um, family members who can both scaffold, you know, and sort of give dimension to the central character um, and offer ways in and also uh, sort of strip away the capacity for that narrative about who is incarcerated uh, to strip away the binary because people talk about doing time on the outside and that becomes very um, clear when you get to know the family members and you know the quote innocence right um, so that helps to allow some other people who might not connect in in our story we also have lawyers uh, they sort of oversaw the rollout of of the reform, and so they were present in a lot of scenes, and they, you know, just by virtue of coming from a different, you know, socio-demographic, socioeconomic status, another way of thinking, but also caring for these uh, people coming out and sort of being able to give us the big picture, they provide another way in. So those were important characters for us. Um, and then back to the onion, right? Because we don't use narration and because we don't use uh, sit-down, experts, we have, we use all our time to just go deep with the characters. And the benefit of this is that, you know, you just sort of get an opportunity to see your core characters living life. Um, they are looking for work. They are struggling to connect with their kids or their grandkids. Um, they're dealing with issues of self-esteem and self-worth. They're having successes and failures. Granted, this is a different situation because, uh, there's also a kind of Rip Van Winkle effect here where people have been away for a long time and they're struggling with technology and so forth. But really by the end, you're hard pressed to find an audience member who doesn't see the people they've just watched for 80 minutes as more us than them. So it's sort of slowly, subtly um, humanizing, deepening, and upsetting the two-dimensional stereotype. The trade-off with um, not having narration and not having experts is that you, there's not, you know, we use slates, so there's that, and they can be very, very powerful um, to have, you know, one framing slate. One in 28 children has a parent who's incarcerated. For African-American children, that's one in nine. Um, so at the right place, you can sort of get a lot of bang for your buck and not have to take up a lot of real estate. Um, but there's also advantages to having a narrator and, uh, and experts who frame things for you very pithily. What we uh, do is really take care from very early on in terms of developing partnerships, in part because it's about being symbiotic with the movement that already exists, you know, that just sort of working in your edit room for two years and pulling back the curtains and saying, you know, here's my film, what can we do? Um, doesn't go over very well. Michael Skolnick, who works with Russell Simmons, calls it the 21st century campaign and says, don't come at me with a 20th century campaign, you know? He wants things that can sort of go over all kinds of media. And along with that, I'd say, you know, being conscious of your partner's needs. So with this project, which actually started as a series of short, short format pieces before the election, profiling people who would, uh, be released if it passed, which we did with Mother Jones and New York Times Opdocs. Um, we also provided like a frame grab for the Brennan Center when they had a, a stat heavy report, you know, a beautiful image of a daughter. Um, we worked with John Oliver, who's been so good on criminal justice. Um, he had Bilal on the show, his only guest in 2015, so that was very exciting. And what Bilal said was, the hardest thing about being out is that you're always defined by this one big thing. You're an ex-con, you're a felon. And it's not just, you know, a question of checking the box. It's how people see you, where have you been, and how you think about yourself. So John Oliver has him on and he says, so what are three things people should know about you, recognizing that this is a problem? 
And, uh, and Bilal says, well, I grow tomatoes. And it's like an uproar in the audience, you know, because this is so kind of off frame for people to see this big, strong, you know, ex-con who grows tomatoes. And he's, he doesn't even go any farther. He just says, Bilal Chapman, ladies and gentlemen, hobbyist tomato grower. And, you know, and that's what millions of people see. And he still gets people stopping him and saying, hey, how are your tomatoes, you know? Um, and then I'll just also mention again, Ford and Fledgling. From very early on, we had partners who were uh, really, their sort of MO is thinking about how to develop the campaign from early on. And so Fledgling, you know, sort of hatched our campaign very early and helped us create the time and space to, to make those connections. And then we've done a panel discussion at Ford and uh, deepened the conversation around the film. So it's sort of thinking beyond the film. Here's Bilal at the White House. Um, he's now a, a main member of our campaign team. He just showed the film to 8,000 incarcerated people in um, Cleveland recently and did a Q&A. I mean, he's sort of the living embodiment of the power of one. Um, what dominant narratives have is a lot. I mean, we've been socialized into them for generations or even centuries. They're undergirded by implicit biases and uh, you know, these American myths of bootstraps, you know, bootstraps individualism and equal opportunity for all. And um, they reinforce the status quo. They're simple to digest. I mean, they're, they're powerful for a reason. But what I believe depth storytelling, the power of one has the capacity to do um, by virtue of its difference from those dominant narratives, its depth, its dimension, and uh, you know, their emotional power to sort of burn into the hearts and minds of audiences in a way that I think can produce some of the most potent fuel for social change. Thank you. <laughs>